now we're reviewing the really interesting one, the Intel 13600K. This is a new CPU. It's about $330 or so. And the price point puts it in direct competition with AMD's R5 7600X, which we already said starts very high for price point, especially when considering the total platform cost with the motherboard and DDR5 now being required on AM5. Whereas Intel, technically, you could still run it with DDR4 if you wanted to. So this one's gonna be a really interesting matchup between AMD and Intel at the mid-range. Let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and their Silent Wings 4 fans. The Silent Wings 4 fans market themselves as being useful on radiators, tower coolers, and cases alike. The fans have a six-pole motor and use a fluid dynamic bearing, which helps with the noise profile and with longevity. The fans use anti-vibration mounts for reduced noise transfer to the case and have a rated lifespan of 300,000 hours. Learn more at the link in the description below. A lot of the story today is gonna to be about that platform cost because CPU to CPU, there's only about a 20 or $30 difference between the R5 7600X, which we weren't particularly fond of for its price, and the 13600K. However, there've already been rumors for probably over a month now that AMD is thinking about dropping its prices for the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs. And if it decides to do so, it's probably in the face of competition from Intel here. So. It's competition sorting itself out once again, although we'll see if it takes until CES to drop those prices. But for today, we are reviewing based on the prices that exist currently, at the time of filming this, one day before launch of the 13th gen CPUs, and we need to give some specs for a baseline of what this thing is. The 13600K has six performance cores and eight efficient cores. That's trimmed down from the 13900K's eight and 16 respectively. And remember, SMT or hyperthreading is not available on the E cores. The last gen 12600K had six P cores as well, but only four E cores. So that's a bump in the new CPU's favor. The base TDP is 125 watts for this one. That's the same as the rest of the Raptor Lake lineup so far. Uh, but max, the one that actually matters, is 181 watts. So that's a lot lower than the 13900K's 253 watt TDP. Just your regular reminder here, TDP doesn't translate directly to power consumption. It's only pretty close. But uh, PL1 and PL2 were how uh, the power consumption numbers differed in the past, where you had tau or a boosting window measured in less than a minute, 52, 56 seconds or so, somewhere in that range. And uh, that would be where you'd have the highest power draw. And once that died off, boost fell down and the frequency stabilized, then it was down to the lower number that was commonly 95 watts or 125 or whatever it may have been. Now though, they just boost indefinitely and hold that higher number. And of course, that actual measured power consumption is influenced by the motherboard, by auto V core and all that stuff. Now with Raptor Lake, you can still use DDR4 motherboards. You can find them online everywhere. And these are cheaper than DDR5 versions. And that means that there's a second factor here, which is motherboard cost. Z790 is part of this launch. There's no real reason why though, you would need to use a Z790 board over Z690 or even B660 for basic functionality and stock performance. Even for extreme overclocking, we're gonna be working with a Z690 board when we bring it to liquid nitrogen, which should tell you that they're fine. So B660 or Z690, they're both still very much alive. And as long as it gets a BIOS update to support the new CPUs, you'll be able to use it. The same goes for the 5800X 3D, where that's a competitive chip. It's somewhere in the $400 range now, and you can use B450 if you want, X470, B550 boards without issue. And again, assuming the BIOS supports it. B650 just became available for use with Ryzen 7000. It doesn't work with a 58X 3D. And while cheaper than X670, it can't bring the total cost low enough to match other budget optimized combinations. We did some really quick work of just putting together a table with some pricing information on it for different combinations of RAM, motherboard, and CPU. So we're calling that total platform cost. This is not the most scientific or deepest dive pricing table you could make. We didn't use price ripping and scraping tools we basically went through and we sorted by boards we thought were reasonable, matched with RAM we thought was pretty comparable between all the combinations and opted for the cheapest reasonable price to get into one of these platforms. So uh, in other words, it's you can probably do it cheaper, but this is what we thought made sense. And this table gives you an idea for it, where with a 13600K, B660, 16 gig of memory at DDR4, uh, you're at 475 bucks. It, it is slower memory though, and DDR5 is starting to show benefit. But if you really need to chop costs somewhere, and maybe you care more about GPU performance and want to spend your money there, this is an option. 
32 gigabyte, so of course brings it up a bit. A 58X 3D is also relatively competitive with the 13600K with DDR4 option, but you look at the 7600X and the pricing gets blown out of the water. And to be clear, that $600 option that we showed for the 7600X, that's with pretty bad memory. Like it'll actually hurt the performance. So you're closer to the 650 plus mark for a 7600X platform. Okay, enough of the basics. Let's get into some benchmarking. We'll get power, production tests, gaming, all that stuff. And keep in mind that the 13600K is most interesting for it's actually really close to max performance it can get with the much better power envelope than the 13900K. Let's start with power consumption because this is one of the more interesting aspects of the 13600K. In an all core workload in Blender, we measure the power at the EPS 12 volt cables. This isolates the results to basically just the CPU and doesn't include total system draw. Intel's 13600K pulled 161 watts, which is 40 watts more than we saw in the last generation i5 12600K and functionally the same as the 12700K. And that one had two more P cores, but four fewer E cores than the 13.6. Compared to the 13900K's insane 295 watts, the 13600K looks pretty good but it's a creep upwards in power consumption for an i5. The new i5 drew 38% more power than the six core 7600X and 49% more power than the eight core 5800X 3D. Going with those AMD CPUs would give you more overall power budget in your power supply to dedicate to other parts like GPUs or accelerators. This absolute power draw is really only part of the equation when it comes to production loads, with efficiency being the other aspect. The 13600K pulled 30 watts in our single core power testing, tied exactly with the 7600X and the 12600K. The i9 class 12900K and 13900K both pull significantly more power, despite this being a single core workload. And that's due to sustaining higher boost and TVB frequencies for all workloads in the i9. And next, before we get to games, is power efficiency, calculated as a simple watt-hours equation. We're judging how much energy it takes to complete an equivalent amount of work between all these CPUs. Our control is the amount of work produced, rendering this frame in Blender, and the variables are time and power. Intel's i5-13600K plotted centrally here, right alongside the i7-12700KF. It's actually a great position compared to last generation, where you're next to an i7, but it's not the chart leader. No one is approaching the 5950X in efficiency just yet. That's still the true king here. It's certainly far better though than the 13900K. The 13900K is plotted correctly in this one. In our previous video, we had one charting error out of the whatever 30 or something charts, one mistake where we already detailed the correction. We linked it below if you're curious what the notes are for it. But in this setup, it's all positioned correctly. The 13600K proves that Intel is blasting the power on the 139 to really try and max out the last few percentage points of performance. It's expected for Halo products, but for something like an i5, it's not, and it's behaving better here. The 13600K ends up more efficient than AMD's R5 7600X in this one, so it is finally outpacing AMD in power efficiency, and specifically, it's doing it between the two newest gen CPUs from AMD and from Intel at about the same price class. So in that regard, Intel is in a bit of an advantaged position here for the i5 versus the R5 in power efficiency. Okay, getting into the game. So most of the games we ran were with the 3090 Ti. There are a couple where that's starting to become GPU bound. And so for those, we re-ran with the 4090 with just the four most immediate relevant CPUs that we sort of pulled out of the CPU closet. And we'll be eventually re-running uh, all of these sets with the 4090, but this will get us started for now. So let's look at some of the games. We'll start with 3090 Ti numbers. We'll start with CSGO at 1080p, where the 13600K establishes itself as functionally equal to the 12900K and 20% faster than the 12600K, which shows good generational improvement over Alderlake or the 12th gen CPUs. The closest current gen AMD CPU is the Ryzen 7600X, barely outperforming the 13600K for $30 less and is strictly the cost of the CPU. Remember though that the total platform cost should be taken into account as well. Now, lows of the 7600X and the 13600K are within error of each other. CSGO has a very wide range for low results and that's indicated by the bars on the chart. The 13600K also falls short of the 13900K, which beats it by 15%. That's in an entirely different price class though, with the 13.9 at 600 plus dollars. Put simply, that means the 13600K gets 87% of the performance of the 13.9 for 55% of the price. 
And another way to look at this would be that you could get a 13600K with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 and a motherboard for about $95 less than the price of just the 13900K at $600. We'd also like to point out the 5800X 3D here. It's very popular. It's a competitive CPU at $400 right now. The 13600K took a relatively small 7% lead over it. Moving to 1440p and CSGO shows that we're highly CPU bound and scaling is intact throughout the stack. We want that kind of bind for showing the best scaling between CPUs. As you move up in resolution or play games that rely more on the GPU, the scaling becomes less pronounced or it's totally wiped out, like when playing games at 4K for modern games and you become GPU bound. Things are starting to look good though for the value of the 13600K here, but we need to check out some other games that load the CPU differently. The Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker benchmark isn't representative of online performance necessarily, but it shows us the scaling in this game, even if the absolute numbers are a bit higher. The 13600K sits under the top spot on the chart, with an error of the 12900K and higher than all of the Ryzen 7000 CPUs. The 13.6 leads the 7600X by about 12% here, whereas the 13.9 jumps way ahead, showing that we aren't GPU bound on most or all of this chart, with a 14% lead. Owners of the older Zen 1 parts, like the R7-1700, might want to consider an upgrade. The jump here would be noticeable. But that's not so for 12th gen owners, of course. Gen over gen, the 12600K is getting beaten by 16% on the 13600K, but that's obviously not a difference we'd recommend upgrading over if you're on Alder Lake i5s already. In Rainbow Six Siege, the 13600K lands in the upper section of the chart, performing similarly to all of the Ryzen 7000 CPUs and the 58X3D in average FPS, with marginally better 1% lows. The Ryzen 7000 parts are hitting a hard wall at about 607 plus or minus a bit FPS average, and that's either due to memory behavior on the CPUs or maybe driver overhead processing the communication with the GPU. We'd have to research it more, but Intel's ceiling is split here and a little bit higher in this one. Now, the 13900K holds a slight lead here of about 3%, but since we're talking about over 600 FPS at this point for average, it really doesn't matter. Some, some people will think it matters but it doesn't. Maybe at a pro level, but probably still not really. So the performance difference going from 615 to 635 FPS, it feels the same. We're somewhat constrained in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where the 13600K ties with the 12900K and the 7600X, but comes out ahead of the 126K by 14% with proportionally better lows. We reran this test using a 4090 as well to lift some of that ceiling and that constraint and gain a clearer picture of CPU performance. So let's look at that. In the 4090 chart shown here, the scaling is significantly improved. Clearly the top CPUs had more room to breathe than the previous test with the 3090 Ti, which was a very expensive card, allowed for. The 13900K was only 4% ahead of the 13600K in the last chart, but that has now turned into a 17% gap with the GPU constraint removed. The 13900K gained 45 FPS average, moving from the 3090 Ti to the 4090, but the 13600K only gained 9 FPS average. Likewise, the 7950X outperforms the 13.6 by 15%, where the previous test it was only ahead by about 4%. Back to the 3090 Ti bench, our 1440p results reinforce how dependence on graphics horsepower for some games can erase differences even between this wide range of CPUs because everything above an i3-12100F is basically capped by the GPU at some point in the benchmark here. Switching to the 4090, the hard cap is gone. Not quite no cap. No cap. Okay. N no capping. But results are significantly freed up here. The scaling at 1440p isn't quite as strong as it was at 1080p when using the 4090. The 13900K here is only 11% faster than the 13600K, and that's down from 17% at 1080p. AMD's 7900X only leads the i5 by 3%, and that is down from an 8% advantage at 1080. Now, if you run Tomb Raider with 1440p for the resolution or higher, on anything lower end than a 4090, you will not notice a difference between the two. In Far Cry 6, the 13600K takes second place at 184 FPS average, trailing the 13900K's 196 FPS average. The 13600K has better lows than the 13.9 in this one, and that's something we explored and explained in our 13900K review. You can check that one out for more detail, specifically what's going on here, but we'll have another chart that helps too. The 13600K also beats all the Ryzen offerings shown here, with the 7600X getting outdone by about 12% here. The 58X3D is close to the 13600K and is within standard deviation. The generational lead over the 12600K is pretty good here. It's about 20%, 19% specifically, 
So 13600K, at least generationally, has a large gap, but obviously not worth making a jump from Alder Lake. Here's another rerun with the 4090, still at 1080p. The 13900K pulls ahead now to take a 9% lead over the 13600K, and the gap between the i5 and the 7900X and 7950X has shrunken by a few percentage points. The biggest change we see by testing the 4090 in Far Cry 6 is actually lower and more consistent frame times eliminating the poor lows that we saw on the 13.9 and the 7950X previously. As for why that happens, we think this is due to basically how the CPU was tripping over the bottleneck previously. We've seen this in games before, where as you run up against that bottleneck or that limitation by the GPU or whatever else is limiting the system, the frame times can actually start to drop in their consistency despite being maxed out for average. Our final gaming test is Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p with the 4090. We skipped the 3090 Ti for this one. The 13600K tested ahead of the 7900X by 9%, again positioning the AM5 in a disadvantaged spot for value comparisons. The 13900K also has limited value in gaming only tasks like this one, where it only outperforms the 13600K by 9%. The extra money saved by not buying a 13900K could go into a better GPU, better case, or maybe more storage, but there are benefits in production applications for a 13.9 at least. We'll kick off our production section with Blender, where we time the completion of a custom GM logo render. Results are in minutes, lower is better here. The 13600K completed the render in 10.7 minutes, which is 26% less time than the 12600K, thanks to higher clocks and more e-cores. AMD's relevant comparisons get buried here, with the 7600X getting led by 32%, and the 5800X 3D getting led by even more. We used to commonly recommend Ryzen 8 and 12 core CPUs for users who specifically mix a little bit of production with a lot of gaming. But the 13600K is stealing that spotlight by offering major advantages in production where i5s previously were weaker. The 12600K, for instance, required 14.4 minutes, so the 13600K cuts its render time by 26% generationally. You'd have to step up to a 7900X in order to gain a significant 25% advantage, but you'd be paying over $200 more on the CPU alone, not even counting the total platform cost we discussed earlier. As for the 13900K, the reduction of 38% is at the cost of a huge hit to efficiency, as you saw earlier, and it's still not at the level of the 7950X. Chromium is up next for compile testing. This provides a look at performance for programmers or anyone who frequently compiles code. The 13600K lands near the top of the chart when using Windows as the baseline operating system, and this completes the job in 54 and a half minutes. That's 33% less time than the 7600X, and it's again only topped by more expensive choices like the 13900K, another 34% reduction on top of the previous one. Stepping up to that level would make more sense if you make money doing this type of thing, but if you're more of a hobbyist or you aren't on an unlimited budget, the 13600K is a more than adequate choice versus the 13900K. And the 7900X competes better here than it did in Blender at least, where it does plot ahead of the 13600K. Our next test is 7-zip file compression, measured in millions of instructions per second, or MIPS. The 13600K posts strong leads over both the 12600K at 38% and the 7600X at 36%. The 12900K and the 5900X flank the 13600K on either side, but both of those are higher thread count, so the i5 is punching above its weight class specifically in that regard here. Moving to decompression, CPUs are generally more spaced apart, but Zen's advantage here wipes out some of that in relation to the Intel parts. Now we see the 13600K only 23% over the 7600X, whereas, just as a reminder, in the last chart, it was a 36% lead. So that's been reduced here. The 7700X is ahead of the 13600K by 7% now, and general placement within the stack for the 13.6 is still respectable, it's just it's lost some of that uh, impressive gain that it had in the previous one. It might make sense still to upgrade from something like an R7-1700 if you're unhappy with it now, or an older i5 like a 10-600K, where you're nearly doubling in performance. For Adobe Premiere testing, we use Puget Bench, which creates an aggregate score built from a set of effects, filters, transforms, and renderer playback functions. The 13600K takes the fifth spot in our list, tying with the last generation 12700KF. The 13600K is outperforming the 7600X by 15% and the 5800X 3D by 23%. This would be a good CPU for someone who's a game streamer maybe and cuts down highlight videos on the side. It'll save some time in that process, but it's still mostly sort of a cheaper gaming-focused CPU. 
Cheaper, obviously, being relative to the rest of the stuff. There's a clear dividing line in the sand at the 7900X and up, where core count starts to show some advantages. Our final production test for this review is Photoshop, also from the Adobe Suite, where we use aggregate scoring based on all kinds of filters and scales and things like that. This is a little more heavily single-threaded than Premiere is, but that reliance has reduced a lot over the years as it's become more multi-threaded, finally. The 13600K shows a strong value here overall, placing high on the chart and performing identically to a 12900K or the 7600X, the latter being more expensive overall than the 136, but not keeping up in our previous production tests. Wrapping up then, we'll cram as many quick numbers in here as we can, because we know a lot of you jump forward. So overall, we think it's good value for gaming. Uh, it is very strong value in production, especially because the efficiency looks good. And the 13900K just sets the, the wrong tone, really, for the 13th gen, where because Intel is pumping as much power into it as they can to try and hold that top rank in the charts desperately against AMD, it makes the whole architecture look like it's just power hungry and inefficient. That's not actually entirely true, because you look at stuff like this CPU, and suddenly it's a lot more competitive. Quick reference numbers for you, just recapping. So CSGO, the 7600X was faster. It was about 5% ahead of the 13600K. In Rainbow Six, we saw those two CPUs were roughly tied. In Far Cry 6, we saw that the 13600K was about tied with the 58X3D, which is very powerful in that game. Final Fantasy XIV, the 13600K had a 12% lead over the 7600X. And in Cyberpunk 2077, the 13600K was 5% faster than the 7950X. And production work, the numbers for Blender were good. The 13600K was 32% faster or less time to render than a 7600X. Chromium was about 33% faster than the 76X. But then you look at Adobe Photoshop and they were closer to tied or just about tied. So this is also the last chance for a new DDR4 build if you want to get one at the end here or more likely if you want to carry some memory over from a previous build and really cut down your cost to build a new system. Uh, for Intel at this point, they're now competing in value, which is not something they've historically done. So good job to AMD for kicking Intel in the ass enough over the last four years to start competing in value and not just market on the Halo products. But AMD now is the one that's kind of out of value. They don't have anything truly low end at the moment. Intel's got the i3-12100F, extremely good value for what it does, and AMD's just not fighting there. Uh, so platform cost is significantly in Intel's favor, just from the quick numbers we ran earlier. And it's looking like the 13 series it makes a strong case for a high-end gaming machine on just the i5. So we're back to that era of an i5 is enough for gaming. And we don't really have a strong reason to suspect that, unlike the past where you're talking four core, four thread versus four and eight, we don't really suspect that game engines will change that significantly, that you're going to just have horrible performance in a couple years or anything like that. This looks like it'll be a pretty, pretty long-standing CPU for gaming performance. Now, as usual, this doesn't make a lot of sense as a drop-in upgrade for, say, like the 12th gen. You should just keep running it. The CPUs are really good as they are. You don't need a 13 series unless it's, you really hate the system you have now. In that case, it might not be the right solution anyway. So that'll wrap up for this one. 13600K is pretty competitive. Looks far better in efficiency than the 13.9. Uh, AMD is still fighting a strong fight, but it probably does have to drop those prices a little bit uh, or get some better motherboards out for cheaper, but that's not really fully in AMD's control. So heating up to be a really interesting market in the next few months. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help out our in-depth testing directly because this type of stuff takes uh, weeks of input from the team to put together. So thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.